oil-free vegan versus olive oil vegan. It's been a while since I've watched a Mike the Vegan video. I think the first of his I ever responded to was the oil, the vegan killer one. Seven years ago now, my oldest wasn't even a year old. Anyway, this new video is probably going to be in that same vein, right? Oil, no matter the kind of oil, is bad. Mostly, I will give Mike some credit. He does walk back his position a little bit. I know a lot of people still think of me as the guy that made the oil, the vegan killer video. And while I still stand by a lot of what is in that video, I have made several follow-ups talking about, for example, context of whether we're talking about somebody who is young and healthy with no disease versus somebody who has severe cardiovascular disease and recently had a stroke, etc. I even made a video about when people would benefit from eating oil a lot, as well as making a oil ranking video. And I will say extra virgin olive oil did quite well on that. While I am glad to hear that, the main problem with that original video is not so much lack of context, but the seemingly intentional misrepresentation of science. He said all oils are bad by using data that did not show that, that showed that there's nuance. Some oils are bad in terms of heart health. They raise LDL, some lower it. They both raise LDL from the participants already dangerously high baseline at the beginning of the study. So what Mike conveniently leaves out here is that the study also used safflower oil in the third part of the trial and that this lowered LDL from the baseline at the start of the study. It was a really bad video and I'm kind of shocked it's still public. Although I guess I shouldn't be, you know, while Mike has a little bit more nuance to his claims, he's still Mike. He is still going against consensus on nutrition. He's still using small studies to discourage oil use, and he is still misrepresenting data. Let's just get right to it. It is this study, which was published very recently. It's actually a pretty interesting short-term crossover. 40 individuals who were randomized into one of two groups. One group eats a vegan diet with olive oil for four weeks. This is called the high olive oil group. And the other group eats a vegan diet without olive oil the low olive oil group. There's a one week washout period where presumably they go back to eating their old diet and then they switch. So the previously high olive oil group is now low olive oil for four weeks and the low is now high for four weeks. Hence the term crossover. The cro they're crossing over. So how much is high olive oil? Well, they encouraged four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil a day, raw, not cooked, so like drizzled on salads or something. And the low olive oil group is no olive oil, basically, less than a teaspoon a day. I think the four tablespoons a day recommendation is inspired by the Predimed study, and the authors do reference this in the paper. That was the huge trial that compared three groups, the control group, which was low fat, they encouraged uh, fat reduction, the Mediterranean diet plus olive oil and the Mediterranean diet plus nuts. In that olive oil group, they were also encouraged to eat four tablespoons per day. Predimed found a lower rate of cardiovascular events, heart attacks for both of the fat groups, the olive oil and the nut groups when compared to the control group, the low fat group. But back to the study at hand, the authors are not looking at events. Again, this is a short term study, nine weeks overall. Instead, they want to see if there's any difference between markers, risk factors for heart attacks, namely LDL. And now for the results, it says, Everybody quit after realizing they were tricked into being vegan. <laughs> I'm joking. Actually, they boasted quite high adherence, but the results in terms of that LDL or bad cholesterol was that in both of the whole food vegan groups, high or low olive oil, we saw a lowering in LDL from baseline, but it was more of a lowering in the low olive oil group. And this is where the results are a bit dramatic is when they were switching between high and low. Comparing that from this chart, we can see that from high to low olive oil, there was a 13 point drop in LDL. And from low to high, we saw a 16 point increase in LDL. I mean, these numbers are no joke. Again, we're dealing with a crossover trial. So there's a few different ways to look at this and to analyze the results. Specifically, what he's talking about here is is diet order in which diet the high olive oil or low olive oil was done first. And here they did find a statistically significant difference, but when we look at low versus high and LDL overall, it is not. Now, that does not mean the results are meaningless. It does not mean there is definitely no difference between the oil and the no oil group. But as I've said before, a non-significant result should caution us from interpreting basically anything from the study. As researchers often say, more research is needed. So why didn't Mike mention this? Why didn't he mention significance? Does he just not 
know what that means? But I wanna be clear, C-reactive protein, that inflammation marker did lower from baseline in both, but it was only statistically significantly lower in the low oil group. So he does understand hypothesis testing and statistical significance, but only when it supports his narrative. Less oil, less inflammation, statistically significant, make sure you mention that, less oil, lower LDL, not statistically significant, but we can leave that part out. Maybe I'm being far too cynical. You know, maybe he just forgot to say it. You know, I, I find it hard to believe given his track record, quite, quite frankly, right? He has a history of cherry picking studies and misrepresenting data. So like, I don't know, man. I think he wants you to hear the story he wants you to hear. You know, the, the dude just really hates oil. And just to put that into context, four tablespoons of olive oil is about 475 calories when you know, you're supposed to be eating around 2000 calories per day. But then a teaspoon at that threshold for the low oil group is only 40 calories worth of olive oil. So you can see about a tenfold or more difference in calories from oil here, which is worth noting. And this is where we can talk about saturated fat, adding up a little bit here because the four tablespoons of olive oil has about 7.5 grams of saturated fat. It's about one and a half slices of cheddar cheese, for example. So he's implying that when the participants were eating high oil, they were getting so much more saturated fat than when they were eating less oil. Per gram, that does appear to be true, mean intake of 16 grams for all participants during the high oil phase, so both periods of high oil, versus 10 grams for the no olive oil phases, 16 is within most heart health guidelines, but certainly it's quite a bit more than 10. Now, if we look at per calorie, there's not as much of a difference there, 18 grams on a 2000 calorie diet versus 14. But wait, the low fat group was only getting 10 grams, not 14. So clearly they weren't eating 2000. How many calories were they eating? The calorie intake was significantly lower in the low oil group. So again, we're combining both groups here. The high olive oil bar is mean calorie intake for both periods of high oil consumption. And then this one is for both periods of no oil. So we have 1,745 calories per day when all participants were eating high olive oil. That's the mean. And the mean for the low olive oil is 1,300 and 38 calories. So yes, significantly fewer calories. Mike's right about that. I would argue for most of us, starvation diet, even for a lady around my age, but only four foot nine and 90 pounds, she would still need around 1700 calories to maintain that weight, 1450 if she were inactive. So one criticism could be, maybe the results were from lower calories. How do you know it was the oil? We don't have all the answers, but oil is the most calorie dense food that we eat at nine calories per gram. It has zero fiber, so doesn't trigger satiation through that way. Mike can spin this as just, well, olive oil's high in calories. So like, of course, like it's a good thing. Sure, but like very few of us can subsist on that few calories in the long term, unless you are very small and like not exercising. And long term is what we care about, right? We care about the, the real world application. What is the real world application of this? Avoid oil in the short term to drastically cut calories and lose a bunch of weight? We all know the effect of weight loss. It is very powerful. It improves almost every single biomarker we have ever researched, but we don't just want weight loss, right? We want sustained, maintained, weight loss. This ain't that. And once people inevitably start eating more, what are they going to eat and how is that going to affect their cholesterol numbers? Those are very important questions and this small short-term study cannot answer them. But here in terms of the number one risk factor for the number one killing disease, uh, it's not looking great. For this high amount, we gotta have some nuance here because there's a huge spectrum between four tablespoons and virtually zero. Yeah, it is a case that you probably could eat four tablespoons pretty dang easily, throw two tablespoons into a salad, you know, and then end up consuming two tablespoons by stir frying a bunch of veggies at a couple meals. Like, I don't think it's that hard to do. Serious question. Who, who, who is adding two tablespoons of oil to a salad? Like I can't even, ugh, the mouthfeel of that. I make a very simple vinaigrette right now for my lunch salads. I'm just having a salad for lunch every day. I don't know, I'm just obsessed with it right now. And it's one tablespoon of red wine vinegar and only two teaspoons, about two teaspoons of avocado oil. And that is plenty. And it's like a good size salad, two cups of romaine, a bunch of cucumber and tomato and beans and avocado. I could increase it to a tablespoon, a tablespoon of oil. That would probably still be fine, but I'd still have to eat four salads to get to four tablespoons. I don't know, man, it's a lot. And even when I stir fry, like 
I'm usually stir frying, you know, at least four servings. I'm still only using one max two tablespoons for the whole thing. But maybe four tablespoons is totally normal to some of you. I mean, it might just be an American thing, right? Because here, normally, if you eat a lot of oil, it's because of stuff like this, right? It's not olive oil on salads. And it does seem that some Mediterranean diet recommendations do say like four tablespoons or more of olive oil per day if you are trying to follow a Mediterranean diet. In both of these groups, the LDL reduction during that second half, once they crossed over after the washout period, wasn't as compelling. It was a smaller reduction. And from the supplementary material, it's clear that this is because during their washout period, on a standard diet, their LDL was shooting back up, didn't make it all the way back up, but it was still lower from the original period. Still, this is a testament to how effective the diet is. Just look at that. I don't see how the washout period explains that. If we look at the group that ate high olive oil first, the top line there, their LDL was lower at the end of those four weeks than at the end of the no olive oil. Carryover effects genetic differences. Then if we look at the bottom line, the group that ate no olive oil first, they started with lower LDL in general, and they dropped quite a bit during those first four weeks of no oil. Point is, it's, there is no point, right? Other than that last thing Mike said. Still, this is a testament to how effective the diet is. Just look at that. Yes, a whole food vegan diet is a really effective way to lower LDL. But an eight-week trial on 40 mostly white women really can't tell us anything new about the particulars of a plant-based diet and how that relates to heart health. Something interesting to note, and then we'll get back to Mike's video because there's some more stuff I want to talk about. While all unsaturated fat is certainly better than saturated fat, there do seem to be some differences between polyunsaturated and monounsaturated. In terms of LDL, polyunsaturated seems to offer a, a greater benefit, seems to decrease LDL more than monounsaturated, and olive oil is mostly monounsaturated fat. If we compare 100 calories of walnuts versus 100 calories of olive oil, the walnuts have 7.2 grams of polyunsaturated, whereas the olive oil has only 1.2. So it's perhaps unsurprising that while the high oil phases saw a bit more polyunsaturated fat than the low oil phases, they saw way more monounsaturated fat. It would perhaps be really interesting to see a crossover like this using something like grapeseed instead of olive oil for the high oil phase. Personally, I think we're getting into the weeds there, right? We're getting into stuff that doesn't really matter as much, right? The, the big important things, eating your fruits and vegetables, limiting your your saturated fat intake, getting in plenty of fiber, which you probably are if you're eating your fruits and vegetables and your whole grains and your beans, exercising, limiting stress, getting enough sleep, not smoking, which weirdly enough, we will talk about more in a minute. Those are the really important things that are going to make a big difference for people. Is there something that people might be able to eat to also increase that flow mediated dilation, that artery function, or at least hope to, but not raise LDL? Well, how about avocados, which I just mentioned from this study, they didn't see an increase in flow mediated dilation, but they say you know, their artery function was pretty good to begin with. And then we have the topic of walnuts, which I think are a great contender. For example, this meta analysis found that they did improve that flow mediated dilation without raising LDL. If there is truth to even a vegan who's already getting phytochemicals going and getting increased artery function from olive oil, uh, there's other places you can also get antioxidants that do the same thing. Walnuts, even straight up olives themselves. Okay, so now we have the implication that the whole fats are better, right? Whole nuts and seeds are superior to olive oil, canola oil, Etc. Dr. Gil Carvalho from Nutrition Made Simple has an excellent video on exactly this topic. This could always change in the future. That's always the case. But so far, I haven't seen any convincing evidence that one is clearly better, period, comparing these predominantly unsaturated oils like peanut, olive oil, canola oil, flaxseed oil, to the unprocessed whole nuts and seeds. So it comes down to personal preference. As long as the overall calories are reasonable, I don't see a compelling scientific reason to discourage either preference. I've heard people say, well, to make the oil, you have to remove the fiber. So you're removing something good, the end product has to be worse. Or for example, this is very common. Well, the nuts and seeds are natural. The oil is processed and unnatural, so it has to be worse for health. The evidence so far doesn't support that. And it makes sense that it doesn't. There just isn't that much being removed from foods to make these oils, right? Fiber, but you should already be getting that from 
other foods. Sugar is often the comparison. Oh, oil is bad, just like sugar. But sugar has nothing. It is so far removed from fruit. It has nothing going for it unless you're starving. Olive oil, even heavily refined oils like canola oil have most of the same beneficial properties that their whole food counterparts have. In the end, this is a very interesting study. I've gotten a lot of flack for poo-pooing oil in the past. And again, I've tried to add nuance to that, but most people just saw the original video. But in a way, this makes me feel a little bit vindicated. Yeah, like <laughs> under the exact context that I'm talking about, we have a missed opportunity if you are eating enough olive oil. Not to beat a dead horse, but you know, this does not vindicate you, Mike. That, that video, oil the vegan killer is still atrocious. Your point here that enough olive oil is bad for you is also atrocious. That is not what the study shows. Even if we ignore p-value, pretend the results are statistically significant, that's not what the study shows. It does not say olive oil is bad for you. I can't help but wonder if one tablespoon would actually make a difference. And uh, my gut instinct is no. However, if you're somebody who just suffered some severe heart event and wanna do everything that you can, I think that's the angle that Dr. Esselstyn is coming from. He's like, anything that might create an issue, let's just get it out of there and be safe. So I kind of agree with this, right? I mean, different populations do sometimes require different guidelines. If you are allergic to bananas, then being told that, hey, bananas are healthy, they're full of fiber, you should eat them, not a good guideline for you, right? It's basically what the study authors conclude, right? Despite lack of statistical significance, the results might be clinically meaningful. So in a doctor-patient scenario, right? A doctor recommending something to their patient, but that this is actually a good recommendation for anyone that cutting out oil, if you're at high risk for like another cardiovascular event, no, that's not what the science says. Again, replacing saturated fat with unsaturated fat, particularly polyunsaturated fat, it's good. So yeah, maybe you do cut out the olive oil, but like replace it with grapeseed oil. If I were in this high risk situation and I was doing everything I could, like I was eating a healthy Mediterranean style plant-based diet, maintaining a healthy weight, exercising on statins, right? And I still wasn't able to get my LDL below 70. I would absolutely try increasing my polyunsaturated fat intake. I would not cut out all oils. Then again, maybe you have someone who is struggling with obesity and they're also struggling with heart health. And maybe, you know, a doctor thinks, well, you going by your diet, what you've told me you eat, it seems like you eat a lot of extra virgin olive oil and that's giving you a lot of extra calories. Maybe let's try cutting back on that and seeing maybe that helps with your weight, which then helps with your, you know, cholesterol, your blood lipid panel. That could make sense in a particular case, but how Mike is trying to spin it, that it makes sense for people who are at high risk for cardiovascular disease, regardless of weight or anything else, you know, caloric consumption, that's crazy. That's not what the science says. For like younger, healthy people eating a vegan diet, should they be deathly afraid of a tablespoon of olive oil? I really don't think so. And so I'm sorry if I made anybody feel that way. <laughs> but I still stand by the idea that obesity in a vegan context is gonna be mainly driven by oil consumption. I kind of agree with him here too, but not the kind of oil he's talking about. Like if he's really saying the, the fat vegans are chugging olive oil or pouring a bunch on their salads. No, fat vegans are fat for the same reason fat omnis are fat. It's this stuff. It's the hyper palatable, sugary, salty, fatty stuff. And living in a culture that encourages us to eat these foods all day long, to snack on them all the time. Okay, so to wrap this up, future studies are needed to determine if these short-term effects are sustainable and translate to improvements in cardiac outcomes. Sustainable, yeah about that. In all seriousness, more research, sure. Again, I would love a study on a higher polyfat oil, some sort of crossover trial like this might be interesting. But in reality, we already have a lot of research on Mediterranean diets, on olive oil, on higher fat plant-based versus lower fat plant-based. Again, I mentioned PrediMed earlier, 7,447 participants, a bit more than 40, right? Actual outcomes, which is a bit more important than arterial health biomarkers. Both higher fat groups, including the one eating tons of olive oil performed better than the reduced fat group. Again, I'm not saying studies like this don't matter. They do, but they have to be looked at in context. They have to be looked at along with the other relevant scientific literature, which make it clear that polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat, very healthy. Olive oil, very healthy.
If you don't want to eat it, that's absolutely fine. You do not have to meet your healthy fat intake with any oils if you don't want to. But to discourage its use and to say that, you know, oh, it's only okay if it's a tablespoon a day, it's just not, it's just opinion. That's his opinion. And now for something very weird. I almost made it its own video because it's, I don't, what? And now for a quick break with today's sponsor, Fume. What? You might have not heard of Flavored Air, which is now a leading alternative to vaping and smoking, uh, but now you have because Fume is one of those devices. What? To be clear, 1.3 billion people smoke and tens of millions vape. 300,000 plus people that have tried Fume. Not really comparable. I don't know if it's a leading alternative. But hey, quitting smoking is literally always recommended. And if this helps people do that, uh, that's fantastic. The problem here is that Mike does not smoke. Fume is not a vape. It's not a cigarette. It doesn't require batteries. It doesn't have nicotine. You are essentially drawing in some air that is super delicious. For example, this is the mint flavor, which I personally love after I eat. He's promoting this as like an after dinner treat. So I think this is a great tool to tackle bad habits. For example, you get your oral fixation in. Maybe it's like a weight loss tool, right? Instead of having ice cream or candy or something after dinner, have some flavored air. The problem here is that he's making this seem really innocuous when it isn't necessarily. Air that is super delicious is really essential oils, which are unregulated here in the US. This means there is no oversight of these products to ensure quality, and we do not know exactly what is in each bottle, the concentration, or contaminants. Now, fume is not a vape. The essential oils are not being heated, so that's great, but it's still essential oils that are unregulated in a little piece of foam that you are breathing in potentially all day. The fact that these products can be potentially inhaled, are unregulated, and have no minimum age for purchase seems like a recipe for trouble. It's one thing if we're talking about smoking cessation, right? Fume is undoubtedly a bajillion times better, safer than smoking. So if you think fume will help you quit, then by all means, try it. Or if you wanna quit vaping, fume is undoubtedly much safer than vaping as well. Try it, but just to use it, just for some like oral fixation. A teen or young adult's health is still going to be much better off if they choose to avoid putting unregulated compounds into their mouth, throat, and lungs. Promoting fume as some innocuous bad habit breaker, like almost akin to like snapping the, the rubber band on your wrist, you know, do people still do that? It just seems really weird to me, especially coming from Mike. The guy is known for using tiny studies to go up against like consensus on medicine and nutrition. As we just saw, oils are bad because a quarter cup of olive oil might not be as good for your heart as not doing that, according to a study on 40 participants. And oh yeah, by the way, but then when it comes to fume. So I think this is a great tool to tackle bad habits. We have no evidence that it helps to do that, that it actually works no evidence on fumes specifically, no evidence on its long-term use. We do have some evidence on inhaling essential oils generally, and it's not exactly positive. This small study on 200 non-smokers found that while light use may help to reduce blood pressure and heart rate, more frequent use was associated with adverse cardiopulmonary effects. Exposure to essential oils more than four hours per day for approximately 10 years was associated with increased blood pressure and heart rate and decreased predicted peak expiratory flow rate. Now, I personally personally would not use a study like this to eschew essential oils, but Mike would, right? When it comes to nutrition, like this is what he does. But I guess when it's a brand deal, I don't know, man, it's a bad look. But then you also have an awesome fidgeting tool. You can spin this little air intake and it makes a nice fun sound. This caught me off guard until I went to the website and see them promoting it this way, right? So I guess they're telling content creators, hey, also it's a fidget toy, mention that it's a fidget toy. <laughs> Clearly they want a larger uh, market, I guess, than just smokers, right? They want anyone and everyone to be able to benefit from fume, AKA pay $70. Yeah, that's right. It's a $70 fidget toy. And that's not including the flavor cores that you have to keep buying. They last only two to three days and cost almost $2.50 each. 
Not sure Fume is a great sponsor if you care about population health. I can see people trying Fume and then wanting to try vaping because of it. Oh my god, slippery slope. But seriously, why push people into being addicted to inhaling through something? Interesting point. I mean, I think most people, just given the price point alone, right, they'll buy this and try it and then go, no, no thank you. And reading reviews, it seems like it doesn't have the same, like, effect as smoking and vaping. I don't smoke, I don't vape, I never have, so I don't really know. But apparently, like, the flavor and everything is very weak and there's no actual smoke or anything, right? Which is part of the enjoyment that people get from smoking and vaping. I don't know, I'd be shocked if someone tried fume never having vaped or smoked and then that led to them vaping or smoking. But again, we don't know. We have no evidence one way or the other. We have no idea what encouraging fume use in non-smokers would do. Also, they're made with essential oils, so the message seems to be avoid eating oils, inhale them instead. <laughs> And yes, by the way, I was asked to promote Fume. I suspect Mike and I get virtually the same sorts of uh, sponsorship offers, right? Lots of like wellness stuff. I think I did respond just saying like, I don't smoke, so this doesn't, this doesn't make sense for me. Maybe I'm being too cynical again, but I just, I don't know. I don't think the Mike, the vegan of a few years ago, would have promoted something like this. Part of me gets it, like YouTube is hard and Mike's views and presumably um, ad revenue are not what they used to be. It can be really difficult to make a living, to make enough money on YouTube without brand deals. But I could be wrong. Maybe he just really does like the product and is not concerned about the potential uh, safety issues there. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts. And because I don't do brand deals, check out my Patreon. <laughs> Videos like this one take hours and hours and hours, so many hours of work, just the notes and the scripting alone. I literally would not be able to make these videos without support from members here on YouTube and my patrons at patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan. And I do post exclusive content there too for tier two members and patrons. I do a vlog earlier on in the month. And then I also do a controversial video, which I'm going to be recording right now controversial for August. Just talking about whatever I want to talk about right now. I'm going to be talking about uh, gender in the Olympics. Anyway, that's it for me. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Please do like and subscribe. And again, consider supporting the channel. And I will have a new video very soon. Oh, that's something I forgot to mention. Like, how were people actually eating the olive oil? Again, they were just told to, like, eat what you want. You know, like, here are the healthy whole foods, right? And also eat raw olive oil, olive oil in its raw state. But like, were there some participants who like at the end of the day went, oh shit, I forgot to eat my olive oil. <laughs> Glug. <laughs> Probably not, but you never know. People are weird. Man, look how cute my bangs are here. <laughs> You're so cute. I'm not getting bangs. I'm not man, they're like so perfect here. My hair in general is so smooth. Like what happened? It just seems more dry. Like I put the, put the hair oil in, but I don't know. It's not the same. I am getting more sun, like a lot more sun. Hmm. That might have something to do with it. Or, you know, I'm seven years older and I'm drying out. <laughs> That's what happens, right? You just desiccate.